Hello there. We are now going to read chapter six of Charlotte's Web. And this chapter is called Summer Days. The early summer days on a farm are the happiest and fairest days of the year. Lilacs bloom and make the air sweet and then fade. Apple blossoms come with the lilacs and the bees visit round among the apple trees. The days grow warm and soft. School ends and children have time to play and to fish for trout in the brook. Trout is a type of fish. Avery often brought a trout home in his pocket, warm and stiff and ready to be fried for supper. Do you remember who Avery is? That's right, Fern's big brother. Now that school was over, Fern visited the barn almost every day to sit quietly on her stool. The animals treated her as an equal. The sheep lay calmly at her feet. Around the 1st of July, the workhorses were hitched to the mowing machine and Mr Zuckerman climbed into the seat and drove into the field. All morning you could hear the rattle of the machine as it went round and round while the tall grass fell down behind the cutter in long green swathes. Next day, if there was no thunder shower, all hands would help rake and pitch and load and the hay would be carried to the barn in the high hay wagon with Fern and Avery riding at the top of the load. Imagine riding right on the top of a great big wagon full of hay. Then the hay would be hoisted, sweet and warm, into the big loft until the whole barn seemed like a wonderful bed of Timothy and Clover. It was fine to jump in and perfect to hide in. And sometimes Avery would find a little grass snake in the hay and would add it to the other things in his pocket. Goodness me, all these things in Avery's pockets, dead fish, snakes, oh. Early summer days are a jubilee time for birds. In the fields, around the house and in the barn, in the woods, in the swamp, everywhere, love and songs and nests and eggs. From the edge of the woods, the white-throated sparrow, which must come all the way from Boston, calls, oh Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. On an apple bough, the Peabody, the, the Phoebe tweeters and wags its tail and says, Phoebe, Phoebe. The song sparrow, who knows how brief and lovely life is, says, sweet, sweet, sweet interlude. Sweet, sweet, sweet interlude. If you enter the barn, the swallows swoop down from their nests and scold cheeky cheeky, they say. In early summer, there are plenty of things for a child to eat and drink and suck and chew. Dandelion stems are full of milk. Clover heads are loaded with nectar. The frigid air is full of ice cold drinks. Everywhere you look is life. Even the little ball of spit on the weed stalk, if you poke it apart, has a green worm inside it. Have you ever found one of those in the summer? Looks like a bit of spit on, the, on a stem of grass. It's a little creature inside. And on the underside of the leaf of the potato vine are the bright orange eggs of the potato bug. It was on a day in early summer that the goose eggs hatched. This was an important event in the barn cellar. Fern was there, sitting on her stool when it happened. Except for the goose herself, Charlotte was the first to know that the goslings had at last arrived. The goose knew a day in advance that they were coming. She could hear their weak little voices calling from inside the egg. She knew that they were in a desperately cramped position inside the shell and were most anxious to break through and get out. So she sat quite still 
and talked less than usual. When the first gosling poked its grey-green head through the goose's feathers and looked around, Charlotte spied it and made the announcement. I am sure, she said, that every one of us here will be gratified to learn that after four weeks of unremitting effort and patience on the part of our friend the goose, she now has something to show for it. The goslings have arrived. May I offer you my sincere congratulations. What an announcement. Thank you, thank you, thank you, said the goose, nodding and bowing shamelessly. Thank you, said the gander. Congratulations, shouted Wilbur. How many goslings are there? I can only see one. There are seven, said the goose. Fine, said Charlotte. Seven is a lucky number. Luck had nothing to do with this, said the goose. It was good management and hard work. At this point, Templeton, do you remember Templeton the rat, showed his nose from his hiding place under Wilbur's trough. He glanced at Fern, then crept cautiously toward the goose, keeping close to the wall. Everyone watched him, for he was not well liked and not trusted. Look, he began in his sharp voice. You say you have seven goslings. There were eight eggs. What happened to the other egg? Why didn't it hatch? Hmm. It's a dud, I guess, said the goose. What are you going to do with it? Continued Templeton, his little round beady eyes fixed on the goose. You can have it, replied the goose. Roll it away and add it to that nasty collection of yours. Templeton had a habit of picking up unusual objects round the farm and storing them in his, ho in his home. He saved everything, mm, a bit like Avery in his pocket. Certainly, 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 said the gander. You may have the egg, but I'll tell you one thing, Templeton. If I ever catch you poking, oking, oking your ugly nose around our goslings, I'll give you the worst pounding a rat ever took. And the gander opened his strong wings and beat the air to show his power. He was strong and brave. But the truth is, both the goose and the gander were worried about Templeton. And with good reason. A rat had no morals, no conscience, no scruples, no consideration, no decency. No milk of rodent kindness, no compunctions, no higher feeling, no friendliness, no anything. He would kill a gosling if he knew he could get away with it. The goose knew that. Everybody knew it. Oh my word. With her broad bill, the goose pushed the unhatched egg out of the nest. And the entire company watched in disgust while the rat rolled it away. And here we have, there's Fern looking on. There's Charlotte in her web. Oh look, peeking through the fence, we've got little Wilbur. And there's the goose and the gander. The goose, she's the, the female goose, the gander is the male goose. Oh look, he's still got his wings from when he was flapping the air. And here is Templeton. And look what he's rolling away. Mm. Even Wilbur, who could eat almost anything, was appalled. Oh, imagine wanting a junky old rotten egg, he muttered. A rat is a rat, said Charlotte. She laughed a tinkling little laugh. But, my friends, if that ancient egg ever breaks, this barn will be untenable. What's that mean? asked Wilbur. It means nobody will be able to live here on account of the smell. Ooh. 
A rotten egg is a regular stink bomb. I won't break it, snarled Templeton. I know what I'm doing. I handle stuff like this all the time. He disappeared into his tunnel, pushing the goose egg in front of him. He pushed and nudged till he succeeded in, ro in rolling it to his lair underneath the trough. That afternoon, when the wind had died down and the barnyard was quiet and warm, the grey goose led her seven goslings off the nest and out into the world. Mr Zuckerman spied them when he came with Wilbur's supper. Oh, well, hello there, he said, smiling all over. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven... Oh, seven baby geese. Now, isn't that lovely? Lovely indeed. That's the end of chapter six. Quite a short chapter, this one. I wonder if we can make a prediction. Quite a lot has been made out of that bad egg. And that if it cracks, it will really smell. And Templeton, I, I handle like this all the time. I handle things like this all the time. I know what I'm doing. Mm, I wonder if that's setting us up for the possibility that that egg might crack in the future. What do you think? I don't know. Hope you enjoyed that. Bye bye.